It's good to have everybody here today and join us. God's love always pursues us, as we've talked about, but it always pursues us for a purpose. And that purpose is to make us clean. That purpose is to change us. It's to change us for our good. To change each and every one of us and put us on our walk with Christ. To turn us away from the path that we all walk on our own, which is the path that leads to death, pain, destruction, and more sin. And to set us back on the path that leads to grace and truth. To life, but not only life, life abundant. On our own, though, we are a dirty, we are a sinful people. We are a cruddy people. And our God, He is perfect and He is perfectly clean. Our crud, our dirt, our sin, it is what separates us from God. But the miracle of Christmas, the miracle that we celebrate each Christmas, is that God's love has bridged the gap, that God has unseparated the separation. And as we turn back to Mark 5, 21 through 43, we remind ourselves that God and his love, they are first. They are not afraid of the crud. They're not afraid of our sin. They're not afraid of our dirt. And as we begin to think about that, I love the gospel of Mark because John Mark, the gospel's writer, had his own very distinct style as he appended the accurate account of the life of Jesus Christ, guided first by the Holy Spirit, but also guided by the firsthand account of the apostle Peter. And John Mark, and he does this here and he does this elsewhere, he does what many people call a Markian sandwich. And Mark, in his writing style, he introduces us to an event. In today's case, this is the synagogue leader Jairus and his deathly ill 12-year-old daughter. And he uses that event like the bread upon a sandwich. Mark introduces us to this event, and then all of a sudden he interrupts that event and he in introduces us to another event, the meat in the sandwich. In today's case, the meat in the sandwich is this woman who has been bleeding for 12 long years, the same amount of time that this young girl has been alive. And he deals with that story, and then he turns back to the bread in the sandwich, which in this case, again, is Jarius in the story. And Mark, in this writing style, he conveys to us a great deal of truth, a great deal of beauty, and also a great deal of practical wisdom that we can take from the life and love of Jesus Christ. Here we are introduced to two characters whose crud, their baggage, their sin, their stuff, for one, has kept them from coming from Jesus thus far. And but to the, for the other, their crud many times and in many instances, even in our lives to this day, will keep us, can keep us from coming to Jesus. Let's talk first about Jarius and his type of crud. Now Jarius is often heralded as a man of great faith, much like the woman that he is sandwiched in this story with the woman that is suffering from bleeding. But I'm not actually sure that Jarius had a great faith to begin with. It appears that he, what he might have had is only desperation. Because think about this with me. Think about who he is and the circumstances that he is facing. He is clearly in this moment, in his final moments of desperation. Jesus is not the first person that Jarius has turned to as his daughter loses and her life is being sapped away. Yes, Jesus was up until this moment on the other side of the lake, but, there, but Jarius is a synagogue leader with a daughter on her deathbed. If Jarius wanted to get Jesus' attention, if he wanted to have Jesus notified about his sick daughter, he could have done it prior to this moment of desperation and this moment of her death, as we will see. She's just a mere moments away from Jarius, certainly with his, his, uh, all the resources that he had at his disposal, could have found a way to reach Jesus before his circumstances became so dire. But yet it is only now in this moment of desperation that he turns to Christ. It's only now when his circumstances have, his, his other options have been exhausted. He's exhausted every other avenue for his daughter's healing that he now turns to Christ. Again, I have mentioned it already, but there are two types of crud that can keep us from Jesus and his love this Christmas season and every day. And the one, the first one that we're talking about here with Jarius, comes from entirely within 
us. And it's otherwise known as our pride, our arrogance, or our own self-reliance. It's this voice in our head that says, we've got this. It's this voice in our head that says, we have everything under the control. It's this voice in our head that says, we don't need Jesus' or anyone else's help for that mariner. Think about who Jairus was and how he had lived life to this moment. He is a synagogue leader, meaning he was a man of power, stature, and authority. And with that power, stature, and authority, he likely carried some of the same self-righteousness that your friendly everyday Pharisee carried with him that we've studied a lot throughout this series. And it's that thought that still pervades oftentimes in our own heads, whether we follow Christ or not, that we can do it on our own. The thought that our culture says so loudly to us that we are enough, that I am enough. The American way that says I can do it on my own. That I can do it and I don't need anyone else's help. And friends, I think that we need to see this because this is a grand temptation for each and every one of us. Living in a nation, and as many of us do, as such an affluent place as we do as American citizens. It is the crud, it is the crud of the thought and the lifestyle that says to ourselves or says of us, of, of, of us that we are enough. Quite simply, I say to you, based on the authority of God's word, that you are not enough. That you cannot get by on your own. You may be able to build for yourself a quite nice life like Jarius, but one day, like Jarius, you will end up meeting a foe that you cannot defeat on your own. Of course, that ultimate throw that, foe that awaits each and every one of us is death. And that's what Jarius meets here in this moment. Here in this moment, the life is being sapped from his precious 12-year-old daughter. So Jarius, in desperation, calls out to Jesus as a sort of last-ditch effort at, effort at the saving of his daughter. And how many times have we heard or maybe seen this happen in our own lives where acquaintances turn to Jesus in their moments, in their last moments of desperation. Now, hear me when I say this. Thanks be to God, Jesus, as the God of love that he is, he hears and he responds in love, even to our last ditch moments of desperations. But the question I have for each and every one of us, if that is your plan, is why wait? Why wait for the final moments of your life to turn to life and life abundant? Why not taste of it that is being offered to you today, today? Why not taste and see how good the Lord is today, not just in the final moments of your life and even into eternity? Because make no mistake, the Lord, He is good and He is gracious and He is faithful to save, even if that's up to the final moments of life. But I say to you, I invite you, don't let the crud of your own pride and self-reliance keep you from Jesus today. Don't let the crud also of your un uncleanness and sin keep you from Jesus today as well. That's the second type of crud that can keep us from Christ. Now the woman with bleeding, this is likely the, a menstrual type bleeding, first hears about Jesus. And when she first hears about Jesus, she isn't letting any time pass in getting to Jesus. She's going to get to him and allow him to heal her as quickly as possible. We read in verse number 26 that she had already spent everything that she owned trying to get better, but her condition instead only got worse. But when she hears about Jesus in verse 27, she says or she thinks to herself, man, if I could only just touch this man, if I could only just touch Jesus, I will be saved. I will be healed. And what we have to see here is for many people, what would have been a thought that went through many of the people around this woman and many people in our society to this day is, man, I'm unworthy to get to Jesus. I'm too unclean to get to Jesus. Even Jesus couldn't make me clean. Even Jesus couldn't help and change my circumstances in my life. Because think about the effects of the, this condition that it would have had on this woman's life in this day and age. Just a, a constant bleeding that she would have suffered from. Not only is she obviously suffering physically because of it, but she would have been suffering literally in every other aspect of our life because of it. She likely would have never been married because of it. And we've talked about before how horrible life was for a woman if she could not get married in this day and age. She would have been ostracized from society and left to fend for herself. 
I mean, she must have at some point had some wealth and standing in society because we read that because of her illness, she spent all that she had to try to change it and try to be healed. But now even all that is gone. All that she once had has disappeared. But think about it from a religious and a spiritual aspect as well. Anyone under Jewish law with bleeding was considered to be unclean. She would not have been welcomed in the synagogue and by synagogue leaders like Jairus himself. Jairus would have had nothing to do with this woman just because merely touching a bleeding person made the other person unclean. She would have been excluded from the synagogue and the worship because of her condition. Yet, here we see two people, each with their own crud, each with a different type of crud, one with the crud of pride that only allowed him to turn to Jesus in a moment of desperation, one with a point of crud from the outside, and one with crud very much from the inside. Yet they both received the same response from Jesus. Jesus re greets them both in the same way. He greets them in love. There are many, and many even within the church to this day, that would have told this woman to stay away. There are many that likely did tell this woman to stay away, but not Jesus. And we see because of nothing more than her faith, and that faith being lived out via the touching of Jesus' cloak and then professed through her mouth, this woman is saved. This woman is healed. I remind each and every one of us today that the same is available and true of us as well. Instead of what was the reality and what is the reality for every person not named Jesus Christ, with Jesus, instead of the dirty making the clean dirty, the clean now makes the dirty clean. This morning, because of God's great love to us, exemplified through Jesus Christ, you cannot make Jesus dirty, but only he can make you clean. Jesus is not afraid of the, uh, not afraid of the crud of our lives. Come to him in faith, and his great love will make you clean. It will make you new. And because of God's great and overflowing and never-ending love, we can come to Jesus in the crowds of life, yet know that we are loved by Christ as if we're the only ones he sees. Know that Christ sees us, that Christ hears our prayer, and that Christ will always acknowledge and confirm our faith. Picture this moment with me for a moment. At this point in his ministry, Jesus is rolling. He's got his ministry off the ground. He is popular. And so in this moment, he steps off the boat, and what he is immediately greeted with is multitudes of people. But out of that multitudes of people, one steps forward and stood out from the crowd that should have stood out from the crowd in stature. Jairus, a leader, comes to him in stature and his place of power and authority, but he also comes to him with a place of an urgent prayer request, an urgent prayer request of his tw dying 12-year-old daughter. And Jairus comes to him, Jesus, in a panic. And Jesus, of course, responds and does what he is about to do to request, but as well as this uh, healing of the 12-year-old daughter, this daughter who's in her final moments of her life, he also takes the time to see this woman who has been bleeding for 12 long years. I mean, when you think about it, you have a 12-year-old daughter, literally moments from her death, or this woman who's been living and ble bleeding and suffering from this condition for 12 years, certainly the 12-year-old daughter should take precedence, right? But that's not how Jesus handles the situation. He's going to, and he does love that 12-year-old daughter of the ruler, but make no mistake, Jesus loves the lowly woman in this moment that's been suffering for 12 long years just as much as the young girl whose life is ebbing away. In this moment of panic, confusions, and multitudes of people, Jesus took the time to look lovingly into the eyes of someone who thought she was only worth the passing blow, who thought she was only worth a, a passing touch. What a rich reminder for each and every one of us. At Christmas season, we just did it, we sing about the reminder of who God is, that he is Emmanuel, that he is the God that is with us, that he is the God that is always with us, that he's the God that came to us in flesh at Christmas time, that he's the God that sees us, that he's El Roy, 
that he's the God that knows our hurts, wants, and longings, and that he longs to one day, and that one day he will take each and every one of them away. What a rich reminder. All this woman wanted was a passing touch, but what she got was peace that only God can give and freedom from her suffering that only God can grant. God loves each and every one of us, and that love reaches to us personally, even in the crowds and confusion of life. But also, thanks be to God, Jesus' love clears up the confusion in life. Now, thus far, I've been talking very positively about the woman who's suffering from bleeding, and rightfully so. One thing that is clear in what we see her and how she comes to Jesus is she didn't come to Jesus with everything figured out. She didn't come to Jesus with the right, perfect theology. Think about it. As she tried, she had tried everything at this point in her life to be healed. We read that she has spent all her money. She's exercised every remedy likely known to mankind and likely every remedy known to witchcraft as well, yet nothing has worked. She, in our day, she's, in a sense, she's purchased every miracle drug that she saw purchased on TV. And so here in this moment, she hears of another miracle drug. She hears about Jesus and how he has been causing the lame to walk and he's been giving sight to the blind. And so she comes to Jesus in faith. That is the one thing that she, that this is the one that will finally make her well. With that, with that faith and that first step, she takes the first step that each and every one of us needs to take. She is putting her faith in Jesus Christ and she is letting nothing, and we see she is letting nothing stop her from getting to Jesus. And Jesus, we see, rewards her faith with healing. He rewards her faith with freedom from her suffering, but what do we also see Jesus do to her? What did Jesus offer her? Jesus offered her to continue to grow in her faith. Read with me verse 34. He says to her first, daughter, your faith has healed you. Now go in peace and be freed from your suffering. The word that is translated here as peace could also rightfully be translated as whole or complete. Be whole and complete. Here the woman comes to Jesus and there is just one thing on her mind. The one thing on her mind is she has to be healed. She has to get this bleeding to stop. And there's nothing in in and of itself wrong with that. And so Jesus, he takes care of that. He heals her bleeding. He affirms to her that her freedom is going to last. That this was not just a sideshow sleight of hand. That this was not a temporary release from her suffering. But she is healed for good. Her bleeding is stopped. Jesus reminds her that he has taken care of her temporary problem of her bleeding, but he also reminds her that he has taken care of her eternal problem and her greatest need as well. Jesus reminds her that he has given her peace with God. Jesus reminds her that he has given her the ability to stand complete, to stand whole before God. God's love clears up the confusion in our lives. And in view of Jesus, if we keep Jesus at the center of our view, if we come to Jesus in faith, even if that faith is far from perfect, far from complete, and far from all together, but if we take our, that first step of faith, Jesus will greet us and reward our faith. He will guide us to our faith becoming complete. He is the one who makes our faith complete. He is the perfecter of our faith. Jesus makes our faith complete, even in the the confusion of our lives. But make no mistake, Jesus also makes us complete. Again, I love this. I love the detail and the writing style of John Mark. He is so detailed and so rich. Jesus affirms to the woman in verse number 34 twice that she is healed. He says, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. In the meantime, Jairus, who is likely and maybe rightfully so freaking out over Jesus' delay in responding to his request, 
And likely, he's wondering why Jesus is so focused on this woman who suffered for 12 long years while his 12-year-old daughter is dying. And in this moment, as Jesus is delaying, it appears with this woman, Jairus gets the news that he had feared all along. His precious 12-year-old daughter has died. She has passed. But Jesus, in verse 36, before Jairus can even say a word, he says to him, don't be afraid, just believe. We don't know how Jairus responded exactly, but it seems like he did, in fact, believe. Because what ends up happening is Jesus travels with Jairus to his home. He arrives at the home and he allows only the inner three of the disciples, Peter, James, and John, to come into Jairus' home. And when they come into the home, they're greeted with a lot of confusion and a lot of commotion. As was the custom in this day, the paid mourners, they would pay mourners to come, and those mourners would come and they would weep and they would wail, and they are doing so, and they are causing a great commotion. And so Jesus goes to these paid mourners and he says to them, why all this commotion? Why all this wailing? He says to them, the child is not dead, but the child is just asleep. And in verse 40, we see a response not of faith from the paid mourners, but a response of literal laughter at Jesus' bold claim that, that the girl is just asleep. And so Jesus puts them all out. He puts them all out of the house, and he takes Jairus, he takes his wife, and he takes that inner three into the child's room. He goes over to the child, he takes her by the hand, and he says, Talitha kuma. Which means literally, I say to you, little girl, get up. Literally, little girl, awake from your sleep. And immediately, the little girl awakes from her sleep. She not only awakes, but she gets up and she starts to walk around the room immediately. And as we think about 12-year-olds in our lives, we think that that in and of itself is a miracle because 12-year-olds don't normally just get up and start about their day, right? There's normally some complaining as they begin their day. And then there's one of the greatest understatements in the Bible recorded for us in verse number 42 where Mark makes sure to note that everyone gathered there was completely astonished. I would say no kidding, Mark. Of course, everyone was very astonished at the resurrection to life of this woman. Then the astonishment, amidst the astonishment and recorded in verse 43, Jesus says, first, don't tell anyone about this. And then he says, make sure that you give the girl something to eat. I want to talk about those two commands that Jesus leaves us with, but I want us to talk about the latter command first. Make sure you give her something to eat. What does this tell us? It tells us that Jesus does not half heal. Jesus does not deal in half healing. Jesus heals completely And fully. Much like he reassured the woman that she was freed from her suffering, Jesus, in telling her parents to give her something to eat, is saying, This is no fluke. This is no joke. This is no empty promise. This is no sleight of hand. And she is no ghost. He is saying to the daughter, and he's saying to her parents, Your daughter is healed. He's saying to them, She is completely healed. He's saying to them, she can do all that it is that she could do prior to her fall, prior to her death. Jesus does not deal in half healings. Jesus does not only partially save. Jesus' love and forgiveness never, ever comes up short. Instead, Jesus heals completely. Jesus makes us fully clean. Jesus sets us completely free. And Jesus loves us entirely. Yet so often we question, does Jesus really love me? Or can Jesus really save me? Can Jesus really forgive me? Can Jesus really love me with all of this stuff and sin in my life? Well, these verses and the whole of Scripture, the whole of God's love reminds us that the answer is yes. Jesus really loves all of you. He loves you just the way that you are. Now, if you've been listening carefully, you might be asking yourself, well, I thought Jesus loves me. 
to change me? How does he simultaneously love us as we are, but also love us to change us? And the answer to that is because Jesus' love is so great for each and every one of us that he loves us enough not just to only meet us where we are at, not just to love us as we are, to not only pursue us as the God that has come from God's throne to us, as wonderful as that reality is, to us, his sinful creation, but the real proof of God's love is that he did not leave us where we once were. That he did not only love us as we are, but he loved us to something so much greater. That his love has taken us to something better, that his love has made us something better, and that, that he has made us something that will last for all eternity. Jesus says two things in, clo- in his closing statement in the passage. One, make sure that, one, to make sure that the healing that they have just witnessed, that they know that it is permanent and that it is complete. And the second, or the first thing that he actually says, is he says, do not tell anyone what they had just seen. If you're like me, if you're uh, reading that, you're wondering, why on earth would Jesus not want everyone to know? Why would he not want the, this small crowd to go out to that multitudes of people that are gathered around and, and tell of them what they had just witnessed? Well, quite simply, in this moment, Jesus' time had not yet come. But what I want us to see, what I want us to remember and live like this Christmas, is that Jesus' time has now come. That Jesus' love has now come. That a time has come for God to send his son into the world in our flesh. For that son in our flesh to live the life that we could never and would never live while facing all the same trials, temptations, and hardships that we still face, even up to death itself. The difference between us and Christ is Christ lived completely free from sin in the midst of all of those hardships. Lived a life perfectly free from sin, wholly perfect life free from sin, and he kept himself truly clean and obedient as he lived among us. That also, the time has come for the Son to not only live the perfect life that we could never live, but the time has come for the Son to live, to lay down the perfect life as our atonement, as the payment for our sins, each and every one of them, no matter how great or how many those sins might be, no matter how dirty those sins might have made us. The time has come for that son to die willingly as our perfect sacrificial lamb. That the time, that, and then for three days later, for that son to be raised to life again, not by his own hand, but the powerful hand of God. And now the time has come that all those who put their faith in that mighty hand and power of God that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, now all that believe in their heart and confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord, they too will be raised to life and life eternal with him. Life eternal with Jesus and in eternity with Jesus is heaven. The time has now come for us to choose. The time has now come for us to decide, to make our choice. What will it be for us? Will we live the life of just a little bit? We allow the just a little bit of sin that each and every one of us has in our lives to take root and to reign, and eventually we become dirtier and dirtier. Will we let the crowds and the noise of this world distract us from the love of God, that God sees us and that God loves us through the noise? Even the noise that we create, or will we press through the noise in faith to see that God loves us? To see God's love for all that it is and to see that God's love is great enough for each and every one of us that it's not just leave, it doesn't just leave us where we once were. But it takes us to something better and it takes us to a change. This Christmas, remember that God left his home in love to pursue you. That God is pursuing you in this moment no matter how your life has gone thus far. Know that God's love is so great. His love for you as you are is so deep that he loves you enough not to leave you as you are, but to call you home to him. Thanks be to God that God's love always pursues us, but it always pursues us 
for a change, a lasting change that will last all eternity. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we thank you and praise you for who you are and the reality of what you have done for us on the cross. We thank you that your son did not come to this world just to merely meet us as we are as some good teacher to teach us a few lists of do's and don'ts, a few good things that we can do, Lord, but your son exemplified the perfect life and is the way that we can have life eternal. That he is the one and only way that we can be saved from our sins no matter how great or how many that we are. But by the profession of that love and by surrender to that love, Lord, comes a change. When we follow Jesus Christ, the reality is we no longer are the ruler and leaders of our lives, but we surrender our lives to Jesus Christ and his way of true and everlasting love, Lord. And so, Lord, I pray that if there are those in this room and those joining us online that have yet to profess their, their sins, though great they may be, before the Holy God and call out to Him as their Savior, Lord. I ask that they, you would move through the power of your Holy Spirit this day and this Christmas season to see that, yes, their sins may be many, but their Savior is so much greater, Lord. Lord, I pray that today, that as those that have been saved by your grace, that our faith would look more like the woman pursuing you above all else, Lord, through the crowds and confusion, to know that you are our healing, to know that our hope and that you are also the hope and healing of all the world that is around us, Lord. As we are a people called by your name, Lord, help us to be a people that show this type of love to all those that are around us. This Christmas week in particular, Lord, let Peckway Church and its people be representations of the love and hope that you have surrendered to us this week, Christmas week, 2022, Lord. Lord, we ask your blessing upon the rest of this service as we have fun and relive the Christmas story, Lord. For it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. This time I'll actually ask if someone would just go ahead and get the children's attention and call them back into the room. And we're going to uh, relive Christmas in a fun and interactive way. In just a few moments, Wanda is going to come forward and she is going to lead us through our, our Christmas program. As we said, it is an interactive program, so we need you all to help. Uh, we have the directions here. The directions are also printed in your bulletin, I'll allow uh, Wanda to get up here and to uh, explain them how she wants in a few moments, but we'll need your participation. So 